Welcome back, this is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. Today we're going to talk about chronic fatigue, or mono, other known as Epstein-Barr virus. So let's get right into the details. So chronic fatigue, mono, question mark, Epstein-Barr virus. Mononucleosis is an increase in a certain type of white blood cell called monocytes. Okay, that's where mono comes from. The most common cause is Epstein-Barr virus, or it's other known as herpes virus 4, or HHV4, okay? So it's actually in the family of the herpes virus. Other causes for elevation of monocytes, or mononucleosis, can be cyclomegalovirus, adenovirus, toxoplasma, rubella, hepatitis A, and HIV. So when you suspect someone who might have uh, mono and the Epstein-Barr virus test comes back negative, it can be one of these other causes. So the Epstein-Barr virus is positive or what we call seropositive in 95% of the adults. Okay. What that means is pretty much everyone has caught it and has gotten over it. The problem is some of those patients, a small percentage, will have chronic Epstein-Barr virus or chronic reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus. And we're going to save that for another video. So teens and adults are the, the main population that tends to get Epstein-Barr virus. So they call it the kissing disease virus, right? When teenagers and adults you know, interact you can get Epstein-Barr virus. Epstein-Barr virus is in the oropharyngeal epithelium. What that means is basically the mouth and throat, basically saliva, or even um, just a little bit of um, uh, vapors from your mouth, uh, which has the virus in there. So oftentimes people are asymptomatic uh, in the beginning, and then they will develop symptoms. So, but the problem is here, that the asymptomatic patient who has gotten over the Epstein-Barr virus can still shed it up to six months. So they can still spread it. So that's why so many adults actually have the antibodies for Epstein-Barr virus. Incubation period is three to six weeks. That means you may not even know that you have the virus and then maybe three weeks after exposure, you may start to experience symptoms, okay? So symptoms, what we call the triad of symptoms, three symptoms, fever, sore throat, or swollen tonsils, right? And what we call lymphadenopathy, basically swollen lymph nodes, especially in the cervical chain, in the neck, in the posterior chain. So you have inflammation of those lymph nodes. Other symptoms for Epstein-Barr virus include headache, malaise, muscle, and joint pain, and then occasionally, actually, um, with the spleen, about half the people will actually have an enlargement of the spleen. Okay? It can become very you know, big and then it becomes an emergency and you end up in the hospital and all that stuff. But you have about half the population who have Epstein-Barr virus in the active form may have an enlargement of the spleen or splenomegaly. A small percentage will also have liver enlargement or hepatomegaly. And then when they take an uh, MRI or uh, CT scan, sometimes you can see this where you have the enlargement of the organs. Now, how do we test for it? Okay. The traditional test when you go to, let's say, an urgent care, wherever you want, uh, and they want to test for mono or Epstein-Barr, so they do a mono of spot test. It's a IgM and they use uh, sheep's uh, red blood cell. It's called a heterophile antibody test. The problem with this test is there are a lot of false negatives during the incubation period, that initial three to six weeks when you have it, uh, you develop a little symptoms, and, but you may not show on the mono spot test. It'll be a false negative. Now, when they do turn positive, it only turns positive for like 80% of teens and adults. And in children, it's only like 40%. So they can have Epstein-Barr 
right? And they don't know they have it, or they have mono, but they don't know they have it because it's only positive in like 40% of those who are positive. And only 20% in, in the ages uh, less than four, okay? There's another test called PCR, polymerase chain reaction test. This is a little bit more expensive to do. And what they do is they look for a qualitative, meaning they're looking for the presence of DNA of the virus. Is it there or not? Do we have it or not? Number two, they do a quantitative test, and this is the viral load, the amount of the viral load in our body. So those are the two tests. This is really not the best test. This is a little bit more expensive, and it can kind of tell you that you may have it or not. What I like to do is something called a viral capsid antigen test, along with an early antigen antibody test, and an Epstein-Barr nuclear antigen antibody, which is EBNA. When we take these tests, we can find out if we have a active infection, past infection, or reactivation of an old infection. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna make a separate video on this test and give you an idea of how to figure out if you have activation of an old Epstein-Barr virus. This is going to be a very important lecture for those people who are chronically sick or chronically have issues with fatigue, malaise. Okay? We're also going to connect the Epstein-Barr virus to Hashimoto's thyroiditis or thyroid conditions because the Epstein-Barr virus uh, has been known to trigger autoimmunity in patients who have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So I'm gonna leave that for a separate video. This is gonna be a very important video in part two. All right, my name is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. And we'll see you guys next week on the healthy side. Have an awesome day.